I'm Holly. And I'm Bridget. And this is Girls Next Level. (laughs) Welcome back to Girls Next Level, everybody. Bridget, did you see the group chat this morning? Uh, Well, I did. I was trying to get ready to get here, but all of a sudden I looked down and there's like 27 messages that I missed. I'm like, what is going on? And it's, it's our OG... Girls oh. next door. Like, yeah, you guys, boy. it's ratchet. So we have this group chat. It's called the OGs. It's me, Bridget, Crystal Camden, and Audra Lynn. And for some reason, we started talking about the most ratchet, like creepy people and like the grossest, like <laughs> on faces. Oh I'm, I'm sorry if I like lost you guys at the top of this episode, but it's like the most disgusting thing. And I was like, okay you weren't chiming in so I'm like okay Bridget's gonna like get off the elliptical and be like this is uh what are we doing here see I haven't even looked at all of it yet but I did I did click on it to see like what was going on to make sure there wasn't some emergency or something and I saw the on faces thing and I was like okay this can wait till later I gotta get ready <laughs> this so is funny. not urgent <laughs> <laughs> or it might be. Well, I'm hoping it's not urgent. <laughs> and I'm I'm blending in with the chair today. If you're watching the video, yeah, I, l- I love the blending in with the chair days. I think <laughs> just it's fun. Head. Yeah, floating head. <laughs> so what else has been going on this week? Well, I'm both prepping for this episode, which always takes me a really long time. I don't know how much it takes you to do these, but like I watch it, I transcribe mm-hmm. everything that goes on because I feel like I need to keep whoever's listening if they haven't seen it in a while, like kind of on track too with what we're talking yeah. about and then I write all my thoughts I feel like it takes me like a good five hours to watch an episode it doesn't take me that long but it does take a minute because you have to watch the episode type every little thought you're thinking and things yeah. you're reminded of as you're watching it and then you have to go back and watch commentary yes so it does take a minute but yeah it's a lot yeah I'm working on another project too so I'm reading this tome of a book it's a true crime and I've already read this book a long time ago but it's a true crime thing I I tried to pitch it as a tv show like uh like a docuseries like seven years ago and it got picked up but then it didn't get made so then that mm-hmm. deal is over and I I but I've been it hasn't left my mind like I always wanted to do this mm-hmm. and then I thought you know what I'm gonna make this into a podcast I'm just gonna like do it. control it on my own own and do it and make it into a podcast because I really want this story to be told and so, you can always sorry to interrupt but you could <laughs> the theme of the day but you can always turn it into a tv show after the podcast that doesn't cannibalize it at all that's one thing I've learned from doing the true crime shows on id is when I went out to promote the first season of playboy murders we were talking about podcasts I was going to do and I'm like well do you want me to talk about cases that we're not covering because if I talk about a case we're covering does that make people not want to watch and they go no we find the opposite we find that people are into it on the podcast and then they want to see the video version too oh yeah so that's interesting yeah so I mean I was disappointed obviously that it didn't mm-hmm. get made into a tv show because I feel like this is a really really interesting and terrifying case yeah so anyway I'm rereading the book I read it a long time ago the book is over 600 pages but not only am I rereading it I'm taking notes on every little thing mm-hmm. that I think is worthy about talking about in the podcast and so um it's taking me kind of forever but that's what I've been working on so oh, fun. between those two these two things it's kind of taking up all my time but yeah, I, I love it project. yeah I love for it sure. like I'm very passionate about this particular story and I think that there's other stories like it that haven't been told and I'm I'm hoping that it kind of snowballs into that too like after I'm done telling this story mm-hmm. that other people will write in and give me like their stories too yeah I like that you have to follow your passion yeah For sure. Do you feel like you get a lot of um, hate bringing up true crime and and murder victims and that kind of thing? I was prepared for that because I see a lot of hate just about true crime content in general and a lot of the issues people have with it. And I understand people are going to have issues with true crime content, period, that it exists because you're always talking about something very traumatic that happened to a whole family, a whole community in some cases. And there are some people that wish that just wasn't talked about at all unless it was coming from the family, you know, but they don't necessarily want to deal with that or talk about that. Like on Playboy Murders, we always reach out to the families and people involved. Sometimes they want to talk, sometimes they don't. Um, But we always give them the option. And, you know, I was prepared for hate, but I really 
don't like I'm kind of bowled over and shocked like I always say like Playboy murders is the one thing I've done in my entire career in the public eye that I've got the most positive feedback for like people love it that's amazing yeah yeah so I'm a little bit worried about that um that aspect of it because I know that there's people involved that don't want to talk about it but I'm a firm believer and and actually Scott Michaels from Dearly Departed Mm -hmm. was the first person that told me this but it's actually this saying dates back to like the pharaohs in Egypt one of them I think it might have been Ramsey had it on his pyramid what do you call it like the entrance way or something like that but that you die two deaths and one is when your physical body dies and the second one is the last time anybody ever says your name that's like in coco too when they put the people on the ofrenda do they say that then too yeah it's like a manifestation of that it's like once you're gone off the ofrenda and nobody talks about you anymore like that's the second death and like your spirit can't come back on day of the dead yeah so and I truly believe that and I feel like in this particular story and so many others this is not unique to this story but it but Mm -hmm. definitely in this story these victims are forgotten like even people that like were around at that time are are forgetting and forget the details and don't under don't like remember how crazy it was or who the victims really were. And I feel like people need to know this and they need to be not forgotten. Yeah, I feel like if something like that happened to me, I'd want people telling my story and telling it in a respectful way and trying to dig in deeper into who was I beyond that one splashy headline. Like, yeah, I think that's important for sure. Yeah, and I also think that, I mean, I love true crime. Maybe it's Mm -hmm. my morbidness in me, but like like I've said before, like I I go to sleep every night watching true crime stuff. It's either Forensic Files or Dateline or, I mean, last night I was watching the the whole thing on Ed Kemper, like talk about crazy and scary. But like I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by it and I know other people are too. Yes. I miss Mindhunter. Remember that show? I love that show. Oh my God. I wish that would come back. And you know what's weird about that too is I did not know about Ed Kemper until that show. And I was like, wait, how do I not know about him? Yeah. Because he was a, you know, pretty well-known serial killer. I think same for me. And I learned about him from that show Mm because he was one of the first people that was like, yeah, I want to talk about it. I want to tell you everything I did. And they were able to, he started the profiling and stuff. Or not him, the FBI started profiling, but using his interviews. He was like the first case, yeah. And he was one of the first people that was really willing to talk about Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. This has nothing to do with today's episode. Exactly. In (laughs) fact, we're as as far off topic as we can get. Today is going to be all about bringing new life into the world. It's about babies. Yeah. So this episode that we're talking about today is called Baby Talk. It first aired on October 1st, 2006. The number one movie in the country at the time was a movie called Open Season, which is a Sony animated film that I know nothing about. No, I don't either. I'm a Disney girl through and through. The number one song was Still Sexy Back by Justin Timberlake. So this episode is all (laughs) about a baby shower we were throwing for our friend Victoria Fuller, who was a playmate. And this was like the first person I felt like who was a friend of mine who was having a baby. Like other than maybe like I did have a friend in high school who had a child really young. But other than that, like in my adult life, this was like the first friend I had who was having a baby. So it was really exciting. That's so interesting because for me, so I have a big family Mm -hmm. and a lot of cousins that I'm really close to, like borderline sisterhood type Mm -hmm. thing. And my best friend in high school got, all of them got pregnant at very young ages. And when you're young like that, like... Mm -hmm. You want your friends and your like cousin and stuff to be there with you and stuff like that. So I, I not only was I around a lot of pregnant people, I was in the room for the delivery. I've cut oh, wow. umbilical cords. I've been there. Like I've been there. You're almost a doula. <laughs> 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 and another calling that I've missed. I missed, but no, I've been in the room and I've been there for a lot of a lot of births and um and, and actively involved, not just you know waiting in the waiting room or whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, I felt very familiar with all of it. Not only that, but my mom when she had my sister, mm-hmm. or should I say when I when I had my sister? Oh yeah, at age thirteen, <laughs> <laughs> I was only twelve. <laughs> Uh, yeah crazy Um, uh yeah I was there for you know all of that too I just feel like I've been around a lot Mm -hmm. of it yeah I didn't have too much experience with babies other than like my little brother was born when I was nine so I very much felt like 
you know, I was helping take care of the baby, even though I don't think I really was. Like, I don't think my mom ever really let me do much because she was very hands on. Like, I don't think I actually changed it. I definitely didn't actually change a diaper. Oh, no. But really? I, I felt like I was like ready to be like the biggest helper. I think I watched him when they ran to the grocery store once and that was probably the extent of it. But I think I felt like I was like on big mom duty just because I was an older sister. <laughs> I don't know. Why. I definitely was on babysitting duty with my sister. Like my mom had to go back to work after she gets mm-hmm. like three months off or something like that. She had to go back to work. And it, it correlated with when I got out for my summer break. So I was taking care of a newborn. Yeah. That summer. Mm-hmm, that's so it was, yeah, I, I feel like I've definitely, I almost feel like I've had a kid before, even though it wasn't yeah. my kid, through my sister mm-hmm. and just like all the people I babysat for and all yeah. that kind of stuff interesting maybe that's why I didn't have like the baby baby um like urge yeah like early on yeah that might have been it because it's definitely a trade-off anytime you're taking care of a kid there's not as much you can do for yourself and if you kind of feel like you've had a little bit of a fill of it you want to go run off and accomplish your own shit you know what I mean yeah it wasn't that I didn't want to have kids I just never had that like super urge that other people get early on I had it Mm -hmm. later now (laughs) now it's too late but like back then I just wasn't like that wasn't my priority yeah for sure do you find that sometimes it's really hard to find beauty products that really understand your needs they're kind of like one size fits all out there but it's not exactly what you're looking for we all know your hair and skin may sway your mood and impact your day in ways you can't underestimate I'd never found beauty products that really understood my needs, but ever since I switched to a custom hair and skin routine with pros, I've noticed so many benefits. Healthier hair and skin, yes, but beyond that too. I got the pre-shampoo mask that I use on the ends of my hair to treat and replenish. I got the shampoo and conditioner with smoothing solution and body boost so it gets rid of my frizz without weighing my hair down. I love Pros too. I even love the packaging. They put your name on it. It's super cute. Pros is so confident that they'll bring out your best hair and skin that they're offering an exclusive trial offer of 50% off your first subscription order at pros.com slash next level. So you get your free consultation, then 50% off at pros.com slash next level. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash next level. Uh, this whole episode starts out with a scene, though, in Kendra's room. Up to no good. Yeah, and we know. <laughs> we know we're going to Kendra's room because it starts with that song. But um, up to no good. I love that hokey music. It was so <laughs> silly. And this scene is impromptu scene all about a wasp in her room and the wasp being shooed out of the room. And long story short, Kendra sees a wasp. She freaks out. She calls down to the pantry to get a butler to come help her out. And DeAndre comes up. Is this the first we're seeing of DeAndre on the show? Oh, really like maybe we've seen a snip of him but I think this is the first like real interaction right well really I, I think know. so which is crazy because DeAndre was one of like the main players like he's one of the butlers I remember the most yeah the friendliest like he kind of felt like I don't know I feel like even though I'm sure like the ages of the butlers ran the gamut and Bryant obviously is close to our age I always felt like DeAndre felt like our age that's interesting which is weird to say our age because me you and Kendra are a little bit different too but I just felt like he very much had like a chill vibe he felt like our age he felt like somebody easy to talk to yeah it's funny even though our ages are all like kind of staggered staggered I still feel like I have like an age that I identify with at that time which has nothing to do with my actual age I kind of feel like that through my whole life. I have like a different age I identify with. Oh, through with. my whole life too. But I mean, I have a specific age. At the, like, and it's not even a certain number. It's just like a certain feeling of mm-hmm. an age that I feel like. Yeah. Like late 20s-ish, mid to late 20s-ish is what I feel like I was at the mansion. I feel like even my, though I wasn't. Yeah, I feel like my <laughs> thing was so weird because on the, in some ways I was kind of expected to be like this other old lady But in other ways, I still felt like I was a baby and it was like massive arrested development. And I never at that point had like my normal life out in my 20s because I just went from college to there. So it was like a weird, almost like second childhood. It sounds creepy to say that because there was so much like sex and stuff going on. But it was weird. Yeah. It was so formative too. Like I see ways that I am now and ways that I think and like effects that have 
been had on me from those almost 10 years that I lived there. And it's almost like I look back and, you know, the way my mindset is, it's almost like the way you would say, oh, well, I grew up this way, so this is how I think. You know, like the way I think about like age and, you know, my looks and things like that. It, I almost want to say, even though I didn't obviously grow up at the mansion, I almost want to say, well, I grew up in a place where a woman was considered done by 28. Yeah. You know, it's so formative. Mm -hmm. It's strange. Yeah, totally. So yeah, at the mansion, I was my mid 20s. Yeah, exactly. So we are. <laughs> anyway, in, back to the bee. Back to the bee because yeah. I have stuff to add about the bee. So anyway, I see that DeAndre comes up to get the wasp. And the wasp looks nasty, by the way. He's just got these oh. long legs. Like this is a bug that gives you the heebie-jeebies. It's a mean. It's a mean. Yeah. Wasp. I can tell. And I noticed something <laughs> weird. So when DeAndre opens the door to come in, I'm right behind him with my dog. I'm clearly dressed for a scene. Like I'm in a cohesive matching outfit. And I'm like... I must have been like ready to do a scene where I'm ready to come into Kendra's room or something because what are the chances that the cameras are right there well, when DeAndre comes up but later in commentary oh, yeah. I say me and the cameras were going to go film something else when the wasp thing happened and we heard all the commotion yeah I was gonna so say so we went in there for the wasp <laughs> yes so you know DeAndre spraying the stuff the wasp Almost gets out the window, but he like sprays it dead. And they do this little memorial on screen where it has like the Latin name for that wasp and like his birth date and death date, which is like two days apart or something like that. Like one day apart. And I ask in commentary, wait. Do wasps only live one day? And Kevin nodded his head, like in affirmation that absolutely they only live one day. They did their research. But is that true? I was gonna double check on that, but I don't even know. I mean, if that's I believe true. it if Kevin he, says it when it comes to a fact. I don't believe it when Kevin says it if it comes to some nuanced emotional thing, but I believe it if it's like a facty thing. Yeah, because in commentary, like I'm asking through the window at Kevin, I'm like, wait, does that look true? And he was like, yeah. like giving me the big nod of, yeah, they looked it up or something kind of look. And did you know Kevin was obsessed with the scene? It was like a cornerstone scene for him. What do you mean? Well, he said to me so many times after this that he is so sad that he can't get more spontaneous moments on Girls Next Door. And he would always reference the wasp scene. He's like, like the wasp scene. I wish I could get more raw, spontaneous moments. But that really wasn't feasible, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, we're on a budget here. The cameras can only be there so many hours. So we have to make sure we're getting all our storylines. So most of our scenes were kind of set up. Like we knew ahead of time what we were filming. There wasn't a lot lot of room for the cameras to just like it's not big brother or the real world like there's not just cameras hanging out 24 7 watching everything we do at first it kind of was though like they would just hang out and be like what are we gonna get which gets me to the second part oh, okay. we can really get spontaneous <laughs> stuff is everything at the mansion was so regimented and I feel like I mean Kendra the least because she'd been there the least and been through the least but we were all kind of regimented to be a certain way at the mansion. Like we never wanted to do anything wrong. Never wanted to piss half off. We know we're being watched by these cameras. So we're just not going to be the most spontaneous people. Like in our Steven interview that we just aired. He had a great point when he was talking about how as an outsider. He came up there and he saw when he'd be in a room with us. The mood would change immediately. And everybody changes when Hef comes into the room. Even Kendra. You know. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we're trying to be fake assholes. We're just trying to not get in trouble. Yeah. So it's it was it would have been a very hard show to get truly spontaneous moments on. Right. But he always talked about this scene. That's so funny because I was watching this scene. Honestly, I was watching this whole episode and it was I'll just say it now, it's not my favorite episode. And I yeah. even texted you and I was mm -hmm. like, "Oh my god, I feel like this is the most boring episode I've watched so far." Yeah, you were like, "I'm not going to have many notes on this. This might be a one-parter." <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have other things that we can talk about that are related to it, totally. but like, I don't feel like this was an exciting episode starting out with this very beginning scene. I'm like, the best we can do for a cold open is a wasp in the house. I know, like, but Kevin thought it was the best thing ever. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah, it is funny. Well, some of the things that I wanted to say about this scene, mm -hmm. though, did you see that DeAndre walks in with a can of Lysol to kill the the wasp oh it was Lysol it wasn't like Raid or something it was Lysol that's funny oh I'm my god like, I don't know I don't know like that might kill you yeah 
but I don't know. We're just working with what we got. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then another thing I wanted to comment on too, at the mansion, they were these old fashioned windows that you like had a little handle that you twisted mm-hmm. and they like went out like this and there was no screens on the windows. I fucking hate screens. Have you noticed there's no screens on my house? Yeah, well, I mean, do your windows open out like that too, like old-fashioned? A few of them do, but not really. But I won't do it because I think they're ugly, and especially like in a vintage home, I just, no. Well, they're ugly in a vintage home where you have beautiful windows that have Mm -hmm. like the, you know, etching and the, um, you know, the lead in them and stuff like the mansion did and like yours do. But in a regular house, I think they kind of blend in and are fine. But it's also very hard to put them on when you have windows that open out like that. Like you would have to have it on the inside, which is, that's really Mm -hmm. ugly. Regardless, there were no screens at the mansion. Yeah. (laughs) And so when you opened up a window... Like, it was just outside. Mm -hmm. And so bugs could fly in like that. So that's how the wasp happened. But I was thinking about this. I was thinking, there. I don't ever remember there being, like, a problem with pests like that. Like, flies or mosquitoes or bees. I know you got bit by or stung by a bee that one time we were doing our... Yeah, that's because I think I accidentally laid down on one when we were shooting on the grass for season three cover. But all the running around barefoot in the backyard and stuff, I don't remember anybody ever getting stung by a bee or complaining of mosquito bites. Which is interesting because all the gardening was organic up there too. So it's not like people were like pumping out Roundup or anything. So it just must have been like really well done. And I I feel like in LA too, like you don't have as much problem with bugs as other places. But you're right. It was nice. Yeah. But it was like the mansion's just located in such a special area, even to the point where I swear to God, it was sunny on that property when it was cloudy everywhere else sometimes. That is true. Because back when I was just a regular fun in the sun guest, I lived like in an apartment with some people in West LA, very close, like Brentwood area. And I would drive to the mansion, which was just like a five minute drive and it would be cloudy and overcast. And I would think, oh, this isn't gonna be a pop and fun in the sun. But the second you get on that property, it was sunny. And I remember reading something about the original owner of that property. When they bought that property, it was called Wolfskill Ranch and it was huge. It covered like UCLA, you know, and they chose the spot to build the house on the sunniest part of the property. That's so interesting. And I'm like, I don't know what it is, like the elevation or the plants or what it, what is it that makes one area in a particular place where the surrounding area is cloudy but that not that it was never cloudy at the mansion but it was more sunny there than it was anywhere else that's funny because you just unlocked a whole memory for me too I remember being at my apartment mm-hmm. in LA which is just over by the grove which is yeah not far from the mansion at all mm-hmm. and thinking there's no way they're doing fun in the sun today it's cloudy and it's cold well, I guess I'll go over there and check yeah. it out and always without fail there was a fun in the sun and it was sunny but even just being over by the grove I would think no there's no way yeah it's like enchanted but I remember having those exact thoughts and thinking it the whole time driving over and like having to bring like a little sweatshirt with me and stuff because surely we're going to be sitting outside freezing cold yeah it's so (laughs) weird I still can't wrap my head around it Another thing about the windows being open that I wanted to bring up, because there were no screens, I had a very Uh strict policy in my room about what windows could be opened and which ones couldn't because there was a sloping roof line that would match up to my room, like going over the little bar area Mm -hmm. outside, that little over that patio area, and my cat got out <gasps> scary on multiple occasions and cat burglar yeah so um I would tell like so housekeeping would come in and clean the room and then they would open up some of the windows mm-hmm. but I would tell them not these windows only the windows that don't have any where she can't yeah. get out but never fail sometimes it would happen mm-hmm. and like there was like three and my sister also did it a few times Anastasia um, yeah outed <laughs> outed and and Gizmo got out and escaped and she would walk the roof line. And I don't know, somehow she was able to get down. I don't know. I never saw it happen. But she was On able. On the ground? Yes. From the second story? Yes. Cats can fucking jump, dude. Mm-hmm. And I think she would jump down into bushes or like a tree and then down. I don't know. I never saw it happen. She has a secret life. Yes, but she would get <laughs> out. 
And I would be, of course, freaked and beside myself. And the whole mansion would be on red alert looking for her. And I remember one of the times Carlina found her. And it was raining outside. Uh And so that's extra, you know. Carlina found her hiding underneath bushes on the side of the house trying to keep out of the rain. All muddy and dirty. Want a stylist who understands your style, size, and budget? And does all the shopping for you? Try out Stitch Fix. It's the easiest way to transform your wardrobe this season. I just got my first package from Stitch Fix. I absolutely love it. I told them I wanted mostly black and they sent me a bunch of black key pieces that I know are gonna be staples in my wardrobe. Plus they sent me this really cute blazer and I don't usually like blazers, but this one's kind of like fun and cute. It's like a plaid design and it's absolutely perfect. I don't know how they even knew. Your stylist will help take your wardrobe to the next level. She knows what will work for you, sometimes even better than you do yourself. And she'll help you to discover new things about your style. It's like your stylish best friend is shopping for you. Because you know that confidence boost you get when you put on a really amazing outfit? That's what you get from Stitch Fix. When you look good, you feel good, and it shows. I just gave my stylist my size, style, and budget preferences. I order boxes when I want and how I want. No subscription required. And she sends me five just for me pieces plus outfit recommendations, and pro styling tips. I keep what I love and send back the rest. It's just so easy. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash GNL. That's stitchfix.com slash GNL. Stitchfix.com slash GNL. That's so funny. So I, when I picture animals, they have a whole like Disney character personality in my head. And when I picture Gizzy going on an adventure like that, it's a different cat than the one that hang out, hung out in your room. Yeah. <laughs> and I know people have mixed views on whether like cats should be allowed out. Like some people think that that's where mm-hmm. they should be and stuff. Not a Persian cat. It needs to be inside. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. But anyway, so that was that. And then I also, sorry, but I have to address this too. Uh, a lot of people were messaging me saying, because I talked about how the windows were never open, especially in Hef's room. Oh, I know what you're going to say. And I have something to add to this too. And a lot of people messaged me because I said that when I was at the very last Midsummer's party in August of 2017, that Cooper was throwing, which was only uh, about a month before Hef's death, but still wasn't allowed to go see Hef. Um, I noticed that the window of his bedroom was opened and I thought that that was very creepy because I know that Hef would not have an open window. Yeah. So I wasn't sure what that was, if they just needed some ventilation in the room for some reason and he was too sick to argue with it or didn't realize it was open Mm -hmm. or if he was being nostalgic for the party and just wanted the window open so he could hear it at least going on but was too sick to go down. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, I don't know what it was, but a lot of people messaged me saying that maybe it was the mold okay Uh, okay you guys absolutely it's not the mold I recently had a mold remediation at my house and when you have a mold remediation they have to seal off the entire area like put plastic up so like you can't go in it's like the scene from E.T. when E.T. is sick and everybody puts on the hazmat suits so they seal off the entire area like you can't go in there everybody goes in there has to be wearing like a full suit and like a ventilator and there's like air purifiers pumping out and they have to like dig out the walls like a mold Mold remediation is serious shit and people are asking about mold because when Crystal lived there she said they found mold and had to do a whole mold remediation at the house and that was like years after we left so I don't know maybe there was mold but I'm curious if there was allegedly mold in the vanity how did they supposedly do that remediation because to do a remediation in the vanity you would have to seal off the vanity which in the smallest scale you could seal it off from the bathroom and the closet but I imagine if there's really mold above the vents in a hundred year old house you'd have to go a little further than that I think you'd at least have to seal off that whole closet and bathroom Hef would have to be moved out of the master bedroom which would be quite a thing because he wouldn't want to be moved out there so if he was camping out in room two that'd be a whole other story in itself you know what I mean and I'm just like how did they do this whole mold remediation and Hef was still in the room like that doesn't make sense to me yeah you don't just crack a window when there's a mold remediation (laughs) happening I think when you and I don't know this for a fact but I think when you are very very sick and you have sepsis and stuff I think that 
you need fresh air in the room. Yeah. I think it can be smelly. Yeah. I don't know that for a fact, but I think that from be, stuff, stuff I've read about what happens to you, I think that maybe they just needed ventilation in the room. That's my best guess too. But I don't know. So the first scene starts out with me looking like a ghost coming down the stairs with no makeup. And at first I thought I was wearing the pink pajamas, but it's really just like a baggy pink sweatsuit. I thought it too, because I was going to point it out. I'm like, oh, there's the pajamas. But yeah. then I was like, oh, nope, it's not. But it looks like them. And the point of this scene is it shows me taking my dogs outside. Then it cuts to you playing with Winnie with her Mr. Bones toy, looking adorable. Yes. And they show a little clip of Kendra with her animals. So I know what they're trying to yes, do is too. be like, they're mothers to their dogs. Yes. This is a motherhood episode, so they're mothers to their dogs. It's it, kind of what they did in the Easter episode. Oh, 100% is what they did in the Easter episode. And if it hadn't been for the Easter episode, I wouldn't really know why they're sticking random dog footage in here. But I think that's their thing. Is like, they're not mothers yet, but they're mothers to their dogs. Yeah. They have that motherly instinct. Like, yeah. look at them all go with their pets, you know? And it shows Alan coming into your room with a tray of, like, a giant cereal bowl. I was like, what is that? But in commentary, we deduced that it was, like, me in there ordering cereal. Yeah, because I didn't order cereal. Yeah. It, my sister did, though. So it could be that they were hiding her still or something. Oh, or that, could, again. that could be true. <laughs> um, in interview, you say, um, I'm throwing the baby shower for our friend Victoria Fuller. She has she was Miss January 19. 1996 and she's also an artist and Victoria's husband John owns a spa and he's also a reality TV regular <laughs> he was on the amazing race and he was on fear factor and can you notice when I'm talking about John I'm laughing yeah. as I'm talking that is literally my next note Holly is la like trying to restrain her laughter the whole time yeah. she's saying this I'm like and as I'm watching this back I'm like why am I laughing but in commentary I explain that Kevin had done that interview with me and he was asking me to describe who is John John, what does he do? Tell us about John. And I go, so John's a spa owner. And he goes, what is a spa owner? And I'm like, Kevin, everybody knows what a spa owner is. And we were just having like a big laugh over that. <laughs> what is a spa owner? <laughs> oh my God. So should we talk a little bit about like how we became friends with Victoria? Yeah. She was a 90s playmate and she was, she worked a lot for playmate promotions and She'd met her husband at the mansion. He had become a regular somehow. I think because he's friends with Jimmy Van Patten, who was a regular. Hef was friends with Jimmy Van Patten's dad. And then they were coming up like on Fun in the Sun and stuff. And every once in a while we'd see them and we became friends. And I don't remember exactly how we became friends, but we did. And I really liked her. And then we started seeing them more and more because we would be like, oh, you should invite John and Victoria to this. And it would get to the point where, you know, with Fun in the Sun happening, I would want guys there that Hef didn't feel threatened by because it just, it added to the energy. Like it was somebody to play volleyball with. It was like a whole other energy. So it wasn't just a bunch of... Of girls sitting around so I'd always ask for like John to come up and Eric Patisha and Jimmy and people like that yeah I'm laughing over here because you say Jimmy Van Patten and people spotted Dick Van Patten in one of my pictures he was like sitting behind me on my birthday mm -hmm. celebration or something like that like blowing out the candles up for a buffet dinner movie and people are like is wait is that like <laughs> Is that Dick Van Patten? Like, they were so blown away that Dick Van Patten was a regular at the mansion. What do they know him from? Because he's kind of old school. I have the dog to, food commercials? Either that or, like, they know, like, the um, reruns of Eight is Enough or something. Mm. I don't know what they know him from. But people were like, wait, is that Dick Van Patten? And then there was another picture from Easter where he's randomly in the background of my picture. And people, I saw people saying it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Do you know what I think of anytime I think of Dick Van Patten is, do you know who Robert Evans is? Well, kind of. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> did you read the group chat? I know that's that's the one person I think of when I hear about that. Okay, so another Dick or another Robert Evans story. So Robert Evans was a big movie producer in the 70s. He was like head of Paramount Pictures and he wrote a book called The Kid Stays in the Picture. Very good book. But he was talking about when he was young in New York, he used to hang out with Dick Van Patten a lot and they would go to strip clubs where girls would pick up dollar bills with their crotches. I'm like, how, how do you do that? Like, I can't move my outer labia. <laughs> Were they picking it up with their holes? Like, did they have to, like, set the dollar bill up a certain way and squat over it and, like, clench it shut like a Kegel? Like, how are you picking up a dollar bill with your vag? I don't know. And is that, that's not sanitary. Do you know how dirty paper money is? That is true. 
I'm concerned and I need an illustrated example. <laughs> yeah, I am i don't want to get too graphic, but I could think of a, another way maybe possible, but I don't know. You're afraid to get too graphic on this particular podcast? Tell us. I'm just saying like if maybe if you're well lubricated, maybe that will stick. Oh, like a and stick and grab, like yeah. fly paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I don't want to get too graphic here, but like maybe you're like, boink. Oh my God, that is so funny. <laughs> so, so when they're talking about Victoria, back to Victoria, they show Italian night. I saw they that. They show us at dinner yes. with the red check tablecloth. And I, I love that they caught glimpses of it because I feel like we don't even have pictures of it really. Like I have too like many. one picture and the only reason I know it's because there's the checkerboard tablecloth. Yeah, I wish there was more coverage of it because that was something that me, you, and Kendra were all so excited about doing. And I had almost forgotten we even did it just because there's so little documentation. Did you see, speaking of that Italian night, we also did like a 50s night, I think, at one point. Because somebody posted a picture of me that looks like we did a 50s night and and I'm wearing the wheels and doll baby sweater and somebody mm-hmm. posted it recently because the the buttons are like really oh stressed. I saw that they said I want to trust somebody the way Bridget trusts these buttons <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a funny meme I think it is I love it <laughs> And speaking of Amazing Race and John and Victoria being on Amazing Race, do you remember that scary scene they did where they were supposed to crawl in some like weird tunnel that was like half underwater and there was like a crocodile in it and it was shot in like night vision and everybody looks like they have beady eyes and night vision. I don't remember that scene, but I I know I watched that whole season. Yeah. I love the Amazing Race. And it was fun knowing people on it. And do you remember we did, we went, we got invited to like the whole Amazing Race after party and stuff? Yeah. That's and where then, I stuck a balloon under my dress and did pregnant pictures. And then all the, well, not all, but a bunch of the Amazing Race people all came to the mansion for like Midsummers or something. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. It was a time. It really was. So John and Victoria are telling Hef that they are with child. Escape to a bygone age of mystery, danger, and romance as you immerse yourself into the world of June's Journey, a hidden object mystery mobile game that puts your detective skills to the test. Play as June Parker and investigate beautifully detailed scenes of the 1920s while uncovering the mystery of her sister's murder. With hundreds of mind-teasing puzzles, the next clue is always within reach. I'm so curious what you guys love about this game because I know Holly and I, we love that it's a murder mystery. We love that it's a hidden object game. We love that it's set in the roaring 20s. I mean, there's so many things that we love about it and I'm sure you do too. Not to mention how relaxing it is just to like spend some time and let your mind drift and play a game. I'm obsessed with the hidden objects game. I could just stare at that and zone out for hours playing that game. I love it. And it's pretty challenging too. Like just when you think you have it down, you can't find the next thing. So I love it. So escape reality and immerse yourself in the world of June Parker. And discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. And, and you- that couldn't have been the first time they have told Hef, right? That had to be like reenactment for the show, I would think. I don't Unless know. Hef is just really unimpressed with people being pregnant. <laughs> and do you think it's weird? And I don't think I thought it was weird at the time, but watching this back now, I think it's weird that everybody's making a big deal that it's a girl and that she's a future playmate and she's going to be a bunny. It's interesting that you said that because there's a future episode that this baby will be on when she's a toddler and they lower third her Trice future playmate and when I was talking about these episodes on YouTube people were chiming in like oh that's so creepy that's so yuck what do you think about that and I can totally see how people think it's creepy absolutely 100% but I don't think that's where anybody was coming from I don't think so either and I definitely didn't think it at the time but watching it back now I'm like oh this is kind of creepy it's not even born and we're like it's gonna be a playmate yeah (laughs) but just to explain where I feel like it was coming from from everybody from whatever producer decided to put that lower third to you know, anybody in that scene saying, oh, future playmate. It's It was more like, you're beautiful, so your daughter's definitely going to be beautiful enough to be a playmate. Because in that world, being a playmate was the coolest fucking thing ever. And yeah. I think from a lot of us participating in it, even though we know it's supposed to be a sexy thing, for us, it meant beauty standard. Like, for me, it was very much a beauty thing. I also think it was... A family thing like part of the family yeah like oh you'll be part of the family business too and it's not like anybody would have ever 
hopefully been creepy toward her once she was born or trying to be like, you know, when she was older, trying to like pressure her to be a playmate. I think it was more like the doors open if she wants to. Yeah. Kind of a thing. Yeah. But I can also see how it looks fucking creepy. But I don't think that was anybody's intention. So circle of life, it's all there. Yeah. <laughs> And in your interview, when we're talking about baby showers and babies and stuff, in the background, I noticed for the first time, there's like a Playboy cover of our looking through the window cover, but it's Gizmo peeking through the window. Yeah. <laughs> Who so, made that? Um, she is a fan slash friend because she's mm -hmm. been a fan for so long that we like have become friends oh, over cool. the years. But her name is Pam and she did all this like cute, um, what do you call that kind of stuff, like graphic art uh -huh. type of thing on the computer. And she did uh, Wednesday's playboy cover Aww. <laughs> and then she did gizmos like things. That's, that's so cute they're really they're both really really cute and then we get to the scene where we're planning with john but before we get huh? to that scene can i talk about one thing that i thought was really weird and it's been on my mind ever since re-watching this episode yeah. like i said i was in the room a lot of times when people were having a baby and stuff and i remember sitting in the dining room one time and this wasn't a dinner for some reason it was just like me you it was just a girls night thing we were all just mm -hmm. kind of sitting around victoria was in there and stuff and we were talking about her birth plan and like how she wanted it to go and stuff like that and i brought up i was uh, and she was like something like oh well i just can't wait till it's out of me or something like that and that part's over because she was really scared about giving yeah. birth and stuff and i said yeah well it's not really over right at that moment then you have to like still do the afterbirth and she was like what <gasps> and she had she no, wasn't informed she had no idea and i was like the afterbirth like after you have the baby then you you're not done like you they deliver the like the placenta and mm -hmm. stuff like that and she was like what are you talking about <gasps> and i'm like um <laughs> like i don't feel like i'm like that knowledgeable where i can tell her all the details of it i'm like well they like do this whole thing where they massage your belly and stuff and then you like like it comes out and it's not that comfortable like it's like not a comfortable fun mm -hmm. thing you know it's like uncomfortable I don't want to go to the point of painful but maybe and she was like no I had no idea so then she went and talked to her doctor about it and then she came back and she's like uh, thank you so much for telling me about that because I had no idea and like she wanted to be mentally prepared for this kind of stuff and nobody told her and it makes me wonder how many details like women don't talk about because it's kind of taboo and how many things your doctors don't tell you about because it's just they see it every day and it's not something they think is I don't know what the deal is but I feel like women's health there's so much we don't talk about details because they're gross or whatever and I feel like we would be so much better off if we knew like what was all expected what was all going to happen and that other people are going through similar things whether mm -hmm. it's our periods or birth or whatever I know a lot of them are gross yeah but they're only gross because we can't we can't talk about them like they're normal things for sure I think that's changed a lot now but like when I was pregnant in 2012 I felt like I kind of knew everything that was going to happen but I think that's changed with the times too because I remember like probably around the time we were filming this episode Jenny McCarthy was coming out with a series of books where she would talk about like pregnancy and just funny things and gross things and stuff and in one of them she talked about how she was shocked to learn right before she went into birth that when you're pushing you're not just pushing out a baby you're pushing out shit too and somebody has to be there like wipe out the shit half the time and she's like nobody talks about this it's yes. so gross but of course everybody talks about it now because she's talked about it in her book so that was something that like I was aware could possibly happen yeah so I think things have changed but I think you're right and I think with prenatal care it's just on the woman to go out and do her own research like they'll give you some information and stuff at the doctor but it's not everything and you know yeah. I mean I even have thoughts that I feel like in a perfect world our healthcare system would require doctors to like set you up with a therapist so that you have somebody immediately on speed dial that you've talked to before to hit up the second you're thinking you might be having postpartum depression after a baby oh, that's a, because yeah. when you're hit with depression and you're in it and you're in the depths of depression it can feel daunting to be like oh I have to go find a therapist now I have to go find somebody I click with I feel like postpartum depression should almost be anticipated or talked because my personal theory is I feel like a lot more people go through it than even admit that they do or acknowledge that they do just because when your hormones 
go that crazy, it affects your mood. Yeah. Like there's no well, way around it. Well, they may not even realize that they're, that's what's happening mm-hmm. to them too. So they don't, that's why they don't identify with it because they don't yeah. know that that's what's happening and that's what they're experiencing. They just think that they're having a bad day or not a good mom or something. Yeah. Spring is just around the corner and it always makes me think this time of year of like little baby chicks and little baby bunnies. And uh, speaking of making babies, it's no secret that consuming a little THC can help set the mood in the bedroom. However, getting that right strain and dosage can be difficult. That's why we're thankful for today's sponsor, Vaya. Vaya has developed a unique blend of pleasure enhancing cannabinoids, libido strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind blowing gummy called High Love. We're talking about pairing aphrodisiac herbs with a mild amount of THC. Their best selling High Love gummy will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. Vaya also offers a wide array of other gummies with and without THC. THC, each with their own unique strengths and effects catered for your routines. And the best part? Via legally ships in all 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. No medical card required. So if you're 21 plus, check out the link to Via in our description and use code NEXTLEVEL to get 15% off. I've been using the Zen gummies to help me wind down before bed and it's been helping my sleep so much. Not only that, but they taste delicious. Let the gummies work their magic. If you're 21 plus, check out the link to Via in our description and use the code next level to receive 15% off plus a free sample. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. And I think it would be so helpful if part of the prenatal program was an appointment where you go in, maybe in the last trimester, you have a therapist appointment, see if you vibe with this person at all, talk about how you're feeling now, how you felt before you were pregnant. So that way afterward, if you feel like you're having a crisis moment, there's somebody you can call that you're at least familiar with. Yeah. And at least knew where you were coming from before. Yeah, you were I, in that this state. might sound vain too, but I feel like even just somebody to talk to about like the changes in your body. Yeah, because it can be really destabilizing a little bit and I'm not just talking about your belly or your weight yeah you know what I mean like what it does to everything yeah I remember I felt kind of depressed after I had my second one because I felt like I didn't recognize my own face anymore and it wasn't that it looked that crazy different but it was I had gained so much weight in that second pregnancy that I just felt like my face had changed and I didn't even know how I photographed anymore and I would go back like when I go back looking for certain pictures in like 2016 or 2017 or whatever there will be like rows of selfies of me just like trying to find an angle I like and being like who is this interesting and it, and that might not mess with everybody as much as me cuz i kind of came from a place where like my looks were how i made my money or whatever but i really was going through like an identity crisis yeah well and and on a smaller note too i mean I know my mom said her feet grew after pregnancy. Yeah, sometimes you have to like throw out all your shoes. Yeah, like and not just temporarily like her feet were swollen and uh-huh. then she had the baby and then her feet went back to normal. Like they grew like a half size yeah. or something. Speaking of, this is interesting because somebody just commented on our Patreon because we were talking about like the eye doctor in our slumber party episode. Oh. Somebody said that she used to have, I forget what her prescription was, but she used to have to wear glasses and contacts all the time until she got pregnant. She started feeling like her contacts were too strong or her glasses were too strong so she just stopped wearing them and then after she had the baby she has perfect vision isn't that weird whoa yeah that's amazing See, like changes happen mm-hmm. and and beyond just like weight and and belly and stuff the changes happen in women when they are pregnant and have a baby and i think it would be great to have somebody to talk to 100 percent. i feel like my rib cage because your rib cage expands when you're pregnant by about like an inch at least because your lungs have to hold have to have more capacity for the baby and you but I feel like my rib cage never went back. Like there's certain outfits that I can't zip up and it's not because my boobs are bigger. It's like right below it, it won't zip up because like my rib cage is bigger. Crazy. Which is annoying, yeah. yeah. It is what it is. So back to our scene, we're sitting in the dining room and we are talking to John about 
the shower. Do you think this is a weird scene, though? I do think it was set up. I think it was more just to give us something to do in preparation for the party. Because we're at this point where I've been trying to make the Playmate house happen for a while. And it's not going to happen. Like, every time I try to set something up there, it's the world's most boring scene. So this is just a different way of doing it. Like, let's introduce John and talk to John about what we could do at the party. And we kind of turned it into this thing where it was kind of funny where I'm like asking John his opinion, but I really don't care because I have it planned anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it turns into a funny scene for other reasons too. Like he keeps saying rose pebbles instead of rose petals. And and then the other thing is we ask him what Victoria likes to eat and he can barely come up with one thing, which is yeah. kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And do you notice that I am si- I bring a box of headshots that are not, they're group shots. Uh-huh. They're like our publicity shots and I'm signing all these pictures. Yeah, because we were constantly asked to just sign a stack. So like, Playboy could have him to send him out or the office could have him to send him out or something. Yeah. It was kind of constant. Yeah. Because it's the second time I've noticed a scene where I'm just like doing all these photos. Yeah. So I have a question for you. John not knowing what Victoria likes to eat. Red flag or more normal than you might think? I think it's more normal than you might think. I think so too. I think it's like on the surface, it's like a really bad look. I've seen people comment about it like, how can he only think of one thing Victoria likes to eat? But also like I was friends with Victoria at the time and I have to ask him what her favorite foods are. You know what I mean? And I think also dudes just like the things they don't pay attention to. I remember growing up, I used to get so pissed because my dad never knew how old I was. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. And I'm talking about the world's ugliest room, which I think I mean is the dining room at the Playmate house, which we don't end up having the party in. But I stand by that. That was the world's ugliest room. You know what I've been thinking about after watching this episode and after discussing with you too, like about how things just don't hit when we do it over at the -hmm. the bunny house, is I think that house had low energy. I think you're right. Everything about it from the fact that it was only one story. I mean, there was like a basement level, but the fact that it was one story to the that there you're right there was a weird energy there and I remember going there and it always felt stuffy even if it wasn't hot in there and I remember it's like you felt kind of stifled and small the second you walked in there yes and and I just uh I just like going back like thinking about how I felt in that house it was always and you wouldn't think so because it had such poppy flashy colors yeah and pop art everywhere Mm -hmm. and it was very like you know, uh, decorated in a non-stuffy manner, but it felt, it felt low energy over there. No, I totally can see that. And it's like, because of the way it was decorated, like with the bright colors and like the mid-century and we love that pool, I always thought it could be such a fun place and such a hub, but it never was. Even with like several playmates living there, I still yeah, felt it like never it had felt a low like, energy vibe. Yeah, and it never felt like the party spot you wanted to go to. I don't know if that's because maybe the mansion was such a hub and the mansion was so cavernous that maybe it just felt kind of eh by comparison, but I don't think that should have been the case. It should have had its own fun energy that was unique, I feel. I think it should have had its own fun energy based on the people who were over there, the freedom we kind of had when we went over there. Like That house needed an exorcism. I think it did. There yeah. was something... There was there was something subduing over there, and I don't know how else yeah. to describe it. And I don't know why it would be. I'm not trying to say it was haunted or anything like that. Yeah, I don't know there was something what the about energy it. was though. Yeah, and it really shouldn't have been that way because I feel like even before it was like painted for a reality show and stuff like that kind of had party house vibes, like party bathrooms, like hot tub in the master bedroom, yeah, things like that. Like people were doing coke in that house. <laughs> So then we have, did you notice how brash and sloppy the cut from our dining room scene with John was to the next scene of Bryant in the pantry? It was like, it almost cut you off when you were talking. It was just like, what? I didn't notice. It was was like an abrupt cut. So it cuts to footage that we've literally seen before on the show of Bryant looking completely unamused. Could I ask you one more thing before we move on? In interview, I say, it's a girl thing. We don't need a boy's input. And I say, I think that John just wanted to be included. And I think that's cute and sweet. Do you think that guys like to be included more now in the shower? Because I feel like it's a thing now where most guys are involved in the shower. 
Oh, I don't know. I've never experienced that. I mean, when I had my first baby shower, my husband at the time threw it for me. But he loves, th- that's what he does. He throws events. So that makes sense. I feel like with John wanting to be involved, oh, like, of course he wants to be involved because it's Victoria and it's his baby, of course. But I also feel like John was so, and I'm not saying this in a bad way or ripping on him because I think we all felt this, but I think he was so like hungry to be part of the Playboy family too. Like even, you know, going back like I think he just really wanted to be part of like everything that was going on and being part of the show making it a little more relevant yeah Mm -hmm. but I feel like it's more and more now that been like it used to be like guys didn't even bother coming Uh but now I notice that like it's kind of like a couple's thing or the guy at least shows up like for presents and cake or something you know maybe misses all the games and stuff but Mm -hmm. comes over for other stuff yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I like to, it. Yeah, I haven't been to a baby shower in a minute. Yeah, it's been a little while for me too, but. So then we get to this scene. We cut to a scene with Bryant in the pantry. We've literally seen this exact footage before on the show of him looking completely unamused as a prank caller calls. And you know what's interesting that you were saying this is a boring episode? Because I feel like there is some kind of filler stuff in here. Like I feel like even though that second scene in the beginning where it's cuts to the three of us with our animals like we know that has a purpose we know they're trying to say oh they're not moms yet but they're moms they're dogs even that feels random and like it's been done before and then this prank call scene why is this even in here and why is this established after the slumber party episode where I'm like I'm gonna call the pantry because they get all these prank calls yeah I don't know why this is just stuck in here for no reason yeah, I don't, I don't know why either. And the fact that we didn't have caller ID. Do you think also because it's like a clip of Kendra and Kendra's not really present in this? I mean, she's present, but she's not really doing that much in this episode other than the wasp cold open. Oh, a way to include her in it? Yeah. So it's possible because yeah. I don't see any reason for the scene in here. Yeah. I mean, it's cute. I like it. I don't dislike the scene, but it it does not pertain to the episode it should have been like a deleted scene or it should have been like earlier in the Kara slumber party episode because then we talk about oh the mansion because it's weird that a couple episodes ago we were talking about oh the mansion gets prank calls let's prank call the butlers but three episodes later let's establish that the mansion gets prank calls it's just so out of order do you think that this um so because I think after the last episode this is episode nine I think so do you think that they only ordered eight episodes and this these are add-ons but they added them on sooner this time before we were done and so they didn't necessarily know we would have a ninth episode let alone the rest of them you know what I bet you're right because this episode kind of mirrors the ninth episode of season one which was me throwing the barbecue at the bunny house and it's a lot of like cut in stuff that was kind of saved from the first date that didn't make it I think you're right so I feel like a eight was like a normal order mm-hmm. and then they'd add on like and if I if I remember right in this season they added on like four more and yeah. then four more again yeah and they kept saying it's still season two but they just kept adding them on and then we ended up with 16 episodes mm-hmm. in season two and I feel like this was not necessarily part of, this was not the original order the yeah I think you're one. right 100 percent and that the first season, or the sorry, the second season actually ended with us coming home from Europe. But I think we knew that we were getting an, an additional order. Yeah. At some point. Yeah, that makes sense. Line. I think maybe that thing that we do with Ryan Seacrest, I don't think it's on camera, but where I throw a fit about us not getting paid for things. Oh, that was happening this early? I think that might have been... At some point with these, because this is why, because so they were paying us now, but barely, Uh like we were getting very little bit of money for, I mean, like a thousand dollars an episode or something crazy like that. And then they added on more episodes instead of calling it a new season. Yeah. And I lost my shit because I was thinking that once we had a new season, we could maybe get a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing a new season, they just kept throwing more episodes onto this season. And I felt like one of the reasons they were doing that was so they didn't have to pay us anymore. Oh. And so there was this morning. It's not, we weren't filming the show. We were uh, going to Ryan Seacrest's show. And we were sitting to do, yeah, to do press for the show. And we 
we were sitting in the green room and I don't think it's happened yet but I think it's coming mm-hmm. up soon and I'm like losing my shit on yeah. and I'm talking to PR about it not that they have anything to do mm-hmm. with it but I'm just venting to them I was hysterical I was in tears like I felt like we were being used and now here we are well, doing we more were. <laughs> we were and here we are doing more press for this show and they're not they won't even pay us and um and everyone seemed to agree with me but nobody would do anything about yeah. it and I was like saying I'm not going to go do Ryan Seacrest show I'm not going to promote this anymore if we don't start getting paid for it and I was really throwing a tantrum and I ended up having to do Ryan Seacrest show but I told them they couldn't put me on camera because they had cameras in the show yeah and I wore sunglasses mm-hmm. and it was clear I'd been crying in the mm-hmm. green room like I think Ryan even came in and said something to yeah. me about it I was venting to him about how it's not getting paid because mm-hmm. he was like in with E yeah I was like somebody needs to start saying something to yeah them. this isn't right but yeah it was major drama so then <laughs> you're walking down the hall. Yes, I'm ready to accost Puffin, which I always loved these scenes and thought they were funny and liked doing them, even though they haunt me to this day. Like, I feel like I can't even have a criticism about anything without somebody going, well, you just wanted to get married and you were just bugging about getting married the whole time and having kids. But I, I even looking back, I still like these scenes and I think they're funny. I think they're funny and I love the music yeah. and, play and freeze frame. Head. And they were done on purpose. Like I know when I come up to half and I go, oh, I have this baby outfit. I guess I'll give it to Victoria because I don't have anybody to give it to. Like I know that's funny. Like I'm not trying to be serious on camera. And yeah. I know he's put on the spot and he has to like do something even if it's like not react. And then they do that funny cut in where they go, do 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 do. Yeah. Like there's still some of my favorite scenes in the show. Totally. And People were asking me if I bought that Minnie Mouse onesie specifically for Victoria, which I did because we had just gone to Europe and Disneyland Paris knowing we were coming to this baby shower right after. And it was just the cutest plush onesie Mm -hmm. with a tail on the back. The tail. It was supposed to be like a Minnie Mouse baby outfit. It was so cute. And I'm telling you, baby merch makes me want to have another kid. Like sometimes I'll be going through Target and be like, why didn't they have that one? I could have used it in the baby section. And one thing they came out with a couple years ago at Disneyland was they came out with these box layette sets that were themed the different rides. I'm so angry they didn't have those when my babies were little. I bought the Haunted Mansion one and I have it. For who, I don't know. Saving it for the grandkids. I don't I don't know who's going to wear it, but I have the Haunted Mansion layette set. And another thing I saw. That was so weird to hear you say. Saving it for the grandkids. I know because like, no, I'm not that old. So who was it who was saying, oh, I was listening to Joe Rogan and Kid Rock was on there. And he said, my granddaughter goes to a private school. I'm like, how does he have a grandkid? Like, I guess. Oh, wait, I wasn't even picking up on that. I was thinking private school. Wait, his grandkid goes to a private school? Like Kid Rock has a grandkid? (gasps) Like he's that old? I didn't know that either. How old is he? I don't know. But it's just jarring to hear that. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, so anyway. Well, my best friend that I went to high school with that had a baby, like one of the people I was mm-hmm. talking about earlier in this episode, she's a grandma because her daughter already had a kid too. Wow. And in fact, I think she has more than one. I think wow. she's a multiple grandma. My cousins that I was talking about are also grandmothers. Wow. It's so scary. <laughs> yeah. It seems so foreign. But yeah. So anyway, I have a Haunted Mansion Layette set. And you know what else makes me want to have another kid? And I know you've seen this because I've sent it to you. There's this person on the internet who had this custom made cradle and it's a swan. Oh, yes, yes. It's like a carved swan and the base of it looks like water and the swan walk, rocks back and forth. I'm like. Supposedly her husband like handmade it. But yeah. I'm like, I would want one of those. Yeah. Really cute. It's Obsessed. really cute. Obsessed. Uh, anyway so merch makes me want to have another kid but um merch totally makes me want to have a kid like dressing my kid up for the holidays and doing holiday stuff anytime there's a holiday I don't care if it's Easter or Christmas or birthdays like whatever I always think oh I wish I had a kid yeah and the outfits are so great like I have crates of rainbows outfits when she was a baby just have to save it have to save it have to save it she's gonna want this and speaking of saving stuff so my brother like I said was born when I was about nine years old so like I remember that very clearly and they had a very cute onesie for him when he came home from the hospital it was this baby blue onesie that looked like a tuxedo with little buttons and a bow and I was obsessed with it and in love with it and I begged my mom for it I'm like when I have a baby boy one day he's gonna wear this onesie so I saved this onesie for I shit you not 
30 years. And it wasn't like packed away and lost. I didn't know where it was. I knew where it was, like up to like zero hour. It was in these crates in the house I lived in with my husband when I was pregnant. And it was with like all the stuff from my early life, like my cheerleading outfits and my high school yearbooks and stuff like that. I knew exactly where it was. But we're coming to zero hour and I can't find the tuxedo anywhere. And I feel like that's eerie and weird. And you never found it? Never. <gasps> I hung on to that thing for 30 years. And that it is disappeared weird. at zero hour. That is weird. I'm creeped out by it. I'm creeped out by that too. Yeah. But on a on a positive note on that stuff, I used to keep stuff too from my sister. Uh-huh. Like if I got her like a really cute outfit or if somebody else bought her something like really cute, I told my mom, I'm saving this. I want, I want to save this because I'm going to put my kid in it. Like so when she grows out of it, I want it. And so I too have like a bunch of baby clothes that I was saving for when I had a baby that were yeah. my sister's. That's cute. I mean, I guess if she ever has a baby, but I don't think she plans on to. I would give them to her to give to her baby, but... I love baby clothes. Yeah, they're still really (laughs) cute, and I still love them. But they're also in, like, exactly like you said, like, bins that are all, like, childhood stuff, Uh yearbooks, and that kind of thing. So how much... Before we planned this baby shower, I hadn't really... I mean, I must have, like, been to a baby shower, but maybe... They oh, weren't. had you? Because I thought you said you hadn't. Well, when we were talking about it earlier, I was like, no, I'd never been even been to a baby shower before. But I'm thinking, no, I must have like glided through one at some point, but maybe it just wasn't that memorable or something. I don't know. Yeah, because I, I was thinking about that one girl I knew in high school who had a baby. I'm like, did she have a shower I went to? And I just don't remember for some reason. Or maybe it was just like a really casual gathering where like we had lunch and exchanged gifts. But I don't think I'd ever been to a shower that was like elaborate with like games or anything. And I think you told me about the poopy diaper game and stuff and I was like oh we're gonna do and the that. baby food game which doesn't show on here yeah I think I told you about a whole bunch of different games mm-hmm. and then because you say I told you about a bunch of different games and you chose the grossest ones <laughs> yes I was really into gross out humor in the early days of girls next door because and it never really caught on but I always thought it would be funny because nobody expects us to do gross things like that's why I drank the stomped grapes at the wine place yeah because like nobody expects like these prissy girls to do like gross out stuff so I thought it was funny yeah uh the next scene poor gizmo I've got gizmo in my hands and Winnie's following me around and I say it's gizzy's day in an interview I say Holly's throwing a baby shower for our good friend Victoria but and I really wanted to help her set up but I have an appointment for um, my baby gizmo she has to get her teeth cleaned first there's a whole thing where she has to go in the crate yeah so gizmo does this thing where she knows I don't know how she knows but my cats to this day know too they know when you need them for something like they have to go to the groomers or oh the yeah vet or something I don't know how they know but they will hide they don't want to be put in that car or put in that crate or whatever yeah and so I had to like grab her before she realized anything was going on which was well before the dentist was actually going to get there and like capture her yeah <laughs> so I put her in this carrying case or her soft case and I set her on that little thing at the end of my bed it's like a faux Shay lounge uh-huh. or whatever and Winnie has to go and get up in her face and she rolls Aww. herself right off of that. I, I felt know. so bad. Poor I feel, I feel bad re-watching the scene too and even in the scene and I say it in commentary but even while I was re-watching it now I feel like I'm going to catch it. Like I yeah. want to like run over and catch her in time before she rolls over. Nobody was hurt. Yeah. She was totally fine. <laughs> totally. But it's funny. So when I actually had my own baby showers, I don't think, we didn't have games at my baby showers, did we? My baby shower? No, but you guys had other fun things. Wait, you guys, you had to tell everybody okay, where yeah. you had your so, shower. So my ex-husband threw the baby shower. We had it at Club 33 in Disneyland. and But you guys, they had the whole Club 33. It was all to ourselves, yeah. the whole place. And it was extra special too because they remodeled Club 33 in like 2013, 2014. So we got to have like one last hurrah in it while it was still in its original state with like the trophy room and And there wasn't games per se that I recall but you guys had a psychic that walked around and did readings for people there was um there was a character character person how do you say that caricature person and like and I think like a person that made the silhouettes like cut out the silhouettes yes I got I tried to do everything yeah I will try to get all the stuff there were the cutest cupcakes that had like a the rainbow um yeah candies like uh-huh. the the belts the sour belts like making a rainbow with clouds on them yeah there were themed dreams that was sly because I don't think I'd like revealed her name yet to anybody 
Had I? Oh, I don't know. I don't think I did because I think back then that was still when people were doing because I remember I did like a photo deal with a magazine and stuff and you would always save like the gender reveal. You'd leak that to the press at a certain time or you'd give the name out at a certain time. Like there was a way you would do it that PR would like say, okay, well, first you announce you're pregnant. Then you can say what the gender is. Then you announce you had the baby. Then after that, you do the baby's name. Like there's a whole way of like stringing it out. That's funny. So you had an Easter egg at your shower. Yeah, I did. That's so funny. <laughs> um, yeah, I just remember, yeah, we had dinner. So there wasn't games like your normal thing. And it was very co-ed. Nick came with me. Oh, yeah. It was like couples and stuff. It was so much fun. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. I had a second one, too, in Vegas, and it was like a sponsored one, and it was for a magazine, and it was at, I think it was at Sugar Factory, and I had, like, my Vegas friends there and stuff, and that one was, that one was more photographed as far as, like, the photographs could go out, because Club 33, like, you can't rent it out and be like, oh, I'm giving these pictures to a magazine. You know what I mean? Because it's, like, secretive. So I had two. And both of them I wore, like, Roberto Cavalli dresses. And I was thriving because he was making a lot of dresses at that time that were just stretchy. Oh. So I could just buy, like, a normal dress and be like, Burr. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. It was yeah. fun. I love my baby showers. I didn't have a baby shower for my second baby because I feel like in 2016 when I had him people were only just kind of starting to do like the second baby shower and they called it a sprinkle which I hate that word I like that word if it's applied to a cupcake but when it's talks to when it's applied to like water and stuff I don't like it because it reminds me of peeing it's so funny because I didn't even know it was called that and then I got invited to a sprinkle not that long ago and I told Holly I got invited to a sprinkle like what the fuck is that and she's <laughs> like oh it's like a second baby shower yeah yeah this wasn't the person's second baby, but I just think that they don't, they can afford to buy whatever they want. Yeah. So I think it was more just like, let's get together mm-hmm. kind of thing. And if you want to get stuff, cool. But like, we don't need, you don't have to buy yeah. anything for us. Yeah, it was weird. I didn't have any kind of baby shower or anything when I was pregnant the second time. And I think I was just going through a weird phase where I was trying to spend more time in LA because I like thought it would be good for my marriage. But I didn't feel like I had very many friends in LA and I felt really isolated and weird and like who would even do a baby shower it was just kind of this weird like lonely feeling who would even do a baby shower I don't know anybody (laughs) that would ever do that (laughs) no it just felt I don't know I was just in this weird place we're looking back like I shouldn't have been in a weird place like I was doing all the things I wanted to do and like thriving in a lot of ways but I was in this weird I mean maybe it was just like pregnancy hormones where I felt like I wasn't thriving and like oh nobody's gonna want to be around me and Mm. I don't know it was weird I was just coming off like writing my two books too which were really successful but I also got a lot of backlash to both even though the second one was totally positive I'd just been through that whole experience which was like trauma part two (laughs) anyway so that's a lot of baby talk (laughs) for this episode we will come back with you guys next week to finish up this episode and we're gonna talk about how to lose friends and alienate people yeah if you'd like more content check out our patreon at patreon.com slash girls next level and we'll talk to you guys next week bye guys bye for more content check out our patreon at patreon.com slash girls next level